This is Coda Radio, episode 153, for May 11th, 2015. everyone, and welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show, taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this year's show goes on. My name is Chris, and most decidedly joining us every single week and established most excellently on the East Coast is our host, Mr. Michael Dominic. Hey there, Michael. Kumbaya, fellow hippies. <laughs> uh, kumbaya, Mr. Dominic. I thought... Today, I felt like we were going to take a real positive spin on the world. We're here, we're cheery, right. it's raining. You know, I felt like it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an upbeat Coda Radio today. You feeling good? You feeling like it's going to be an upbeat episode? You know what? I'm feeling great. <laughs> good, yeah. good. I'm filled with joy, Chris, actually. Whoa, whoa. I wonder if that's because of your new your new friend, Electron, that came into your life, which we'll be talking about a little bit later today. You know, maybe, yeah. you know, you meet somebody new. You, there's this thing. Uh, it's, it's a documented scientific thing called new relationship energy. Mm. And you've got that NRE with Electron. Wait, what? Did you what? Uh- I actually don't know much about it, so I'm really, I'm really curious to pick it, your brain about that. It's pretty cool, but, but first. Yes, but first, we do have some hoopla to get to, and can I tell you about my morning? I mean, this isn't really coder radio related, but I actually think there is, <clears throat> there is some insight. So, like, when you're creating a project, uh, like, a lot of times, like, you have to walk the line of when to announce it. Mm-hmm. And when to keep it a secret, so that way when you announce it, it's pretty close to what people are going to see. Because if you announce something ahead of times, sometimes... Bad things happen. People get expectations, Mr. Dominic. Yeah. Now, are, are you are you are you in the chat room uh, right now? I am indeed. Yeah. Do you see that link in the chat room? <clears throat> they just got uh, put in there by, by by PID one there. That link there. Now, if you uh, if you track that link back, what it does, Mr. Dominic, is it takes you to this website called Reddit. Mm-hmm. And uh, <clears throat> you see, Reddit often has things that were posted on Twitter. <laughs> Twice this week, Mr. Dominic, somebody has posted something on Twitter that has then made it to Reddit, which has then become news, and then everybody has found out about something that I had no intention of anybody knowing anything about. <laughs> it happened to me Friday and today, <laughs> right before we went on air. So uh, Friday morning, <clears throat> I woke up, and this is what I do, Mr. Dominic. I wake up, you know, I follow the news for this show, for the Linux Action Show, for Linux Unplugged. I, I check the news every morning. Specifically, the Linux and open source news. And I go to Reddit, and I notice at the top of our Linux is a story that says, the Linux Action Show will be live at noon, d- uh, d- uh, interviewing the lead developer of Krita. Now, Krita is a pretty cool art uh, open source program. This is the first time, Mr. Dominic, I'd ever heard about this. I didn't know I was going to be interviewing anybody at noon, let alone doing it live, <laughs> until I went to the top of Reddit and saw it as the top story. Because the guest made an incorrect assumption, which is fine, it all worked out, but he made the incorrect assumption that we were going to be doing it live. So he tweeted that we were going to be live, and there was interest in that, and so it spread around, and now I went from having a Friday off and going to take a hike to... Now I'm in studio at noon doing an interview. Um, pretty interesting, but it worked out. I was a little stressful, but it worked out. Uh, so Monday morning, today, comes around, and I'm on my way into the studio, and I, I just realized, oh, I've had my phone on mute uh, this morning because I was trying to focus. And so I look down at my phone, and I see five new messages from two different chats, which is usually a warning sign to me that something has gone wrong, and mm. two different people have tried to tell me about it now. <laughs> Mm. So I open up my phone, and I discover that the announcement of a new Jupiter Broadcasting show, which I had not announced, is at the top of the subreddit. And uh, <clears throat> because uh, the new uh, host had tweeted that he'd be making a show, which I never said keep it a secret. Uh, just the, no- the way I have learned to work over time now is a lot of times before I, I don't really say much before I ship. You know, uh, I think we even did Coda right. Radio that way. We, we basically kept a lid on mm. it until we had episode one done. Right, we shipped like a very weird episode one and then just 
yeah. went. Yeah. yeah. And so that's usually the way I go. So that way, because if you if you announce too far ahead of time, then everybody out lays out all the things they want from that show and it becomes something that can't please anybody. So right. I generally don't. So it's been this interesting like, OK, well, so now something that I was keeping a secret until I was ready to reveal it, just going to roll with it now. It's a public thing we're doing now. We're doing this in the public. And it's like and within 30 seconds, you have to make this pivot from my project is a big secret to now everybody knows about my project. Well, if it makes you feel better, I didn't know about it till just now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I figured might as well finish the damage now. Uh, so <laughs> that's been my morning, which has been a little and that and Friday morning, both very nuts. It's very it's very weird to go to a popular news website and learn something about your own company from it. That's a very odd feeling like, oh, I'm finding out about this for the first time and I'm the one doing it. Okay. Yeah, that's not great. So, so what is the show? It's uh, Foss. Floss Weekly. Uh, yeah. He, it, uh, so uh, Benjamin Caracera, or Caracina, that's probably how you say his name. Uh, he is a uh, former Firefox contributor. He's worked with Mozilla Foundation for a long time. He's worked on Firefox OS. He's a, he is one of the, uh, I think, best advocates because I see him out. Um, out and about at conferences all the time, and he's such a, a great evangelist for the platform. He's a community manager. Uh, he's a developer. He's a speaker, um, and he's also a, a photography buff. And so, <clears throat> he's got a lot of experience with uh, hardware devices and um, like Firefox OS type devices, but also the higher range, the upper range stuff. Like uh, he spent a lot of time. He was he used to be a member of, a, of the Ubuntu. Uh, he used to be an Ubuntu member. I don't know what that's called, but you know, you become an Ubuntu member and you get an at ubuntu.com address and. All right. of that goodness. And he was a contributor to the Ubuntu project as well. So he's made a lot of contacts over the years. So it'll probably be like an in- interview style show, um, sort of like women's tech radio, but uh, with uh, specifically some of the developers he's worked with in the past <clears throat> and others. And then he might do other things. He may choose to do other things like news. And, you know, of course, as you well know, I mean, the shows change over time depending on. Right, right, right. They'll change. Yeah. So, but uh, <clears throat> it's one of those things where he and I, this is why actually I never really talked much about it is because. He and I have been talking. He and I first started talking about it last year at OSCON in Portland, Oregon, which is coming up in like a month. So it's almost been a year. And uh, we talked on and off, and then it sort of uh, there at the conference, and then it transitioned over to emails. And so it's just sort of been an ongoing thread. <clears throat> so I was just kind of surprised. Um, but I'm, I'm pretty happy. I'm pretty excited. I think it's going to be a really good show. And uh, he's a super smart guy. So as soon as he asked, I was like, yes. Like, you know, in the back of my mind, I sometimes like have a list of people who are an open source that I think would make good podcasters. And I often thought, I wonder why he doesn't have his own podcast. He'd make a really good podcaster. So when he came to me and said, hey, what do you think about doing a show? I was like, yeah, I've been thinking you should have a show for a while. So, yeah, let's definitely do it. So pretty cool. So uh, good, good. Yeah. Yeah. That was intense. That was really. In- I feel like last week was a super intense week. Like you had your big announcement about yes. uh, Buccaneer Tech, which was great. I think people are really excited about that. Surprisingly so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, and then Friday was <laughs> just a total was a total like you know and you know what, Mike, I never I never like set aside time on my schedule to go for a hike. Like that's mm. i I think I've literally never ever done that in my life. So this was like the first time in my life that I set aside a s- time to go on a hike to clear my mind. And also the whole point of this interview was that Noah was gonna conduct it completely on his own from Grand Forks. He was so that way I wouldn't have to be oh, involved. Okay, okay. So you were, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the whole idea was let's see if that because because the problem is a lot of guests don't want to be interviewed on a Sunday. They want to be interviewed during the week, which is much harder for me because I have other shows during the week. But Noah is available at different times, so he was going to take the interview, talk to the guy, get all that taken care of, and then we were just going to sit down on Sunday and roll it. So I scheduled and I, and the reason why I mention this is because. <clears throat> I'm going to do it again, and I think the audience should try to do this too if they're feeling burned out or like their creative juices aren't flowing very well. Schedule some downtime. Just make it part of your calendar, and then it's a little easier to accomplish is you, if you actually set aside time for it. Although <clears throat> sometimes the internet has different plans, which was the case this time. So, yeah. All right, Mr. Dominic. Well, we do have some hoopla to get into. Uh, we also have uh, – I, I also have one bit of, uh, of uh, uh, follow-up we could uh, cover as well. I grabbed it from the subreddit. Let's do it. Let's uh, do it. This is a quick one. We normally – we've been mixing things up a little bit, and I thought we, uh, we, we used to do the book picks at the end and the feedback at the beginning. And now this is like a combination of the two. Um, so uh, – Cruel Fate was asking if people have checked out the Phoenix Project. He says uh, he's hoping to get yes. some. Have you have you heard of it? 
I heard of it in the subreddit. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, it's a novel about IT DevOps and helping your business win. Uh, and so, <clears throat> as is awesome in our community, the Swiss Army chimed in with uh, a little bit of uh, info. So this is what's great about submitting to the subreddit is we just have a lot of really great people listening. So the Swiss Army says, I'm most of the way through it. It's a fun read and a good intro to a lot of organizational ideas that you may have heard of or not have heard of, but I didn't. Uh, I don't know how many they may or may not apply. I definitely recommend it though. So it's called The Phoenix Project, and it's a novel about IT, DevOps, and helping your business win. <clears throat> helping your business win part sounds a little Vaynerchuk for my like, but yeah. uh, it actually, you know what? Sometimes that kind of sappy motivational speak actually does sink in a little bit and works. I mean, you know, I'm just saying. Sometimes that actually does work. I know it sounds sappy, but... It is sappy, but it's okay. <laughs> the Phoenix Project. <laughs> All right, so, so, so we have some hoopla to get to. Yes, Do you want to start there before we get to the... Uh, well, let's do the subreddit one first, then. Oh, okay. Uh, well, okay, yeah. The failure, Chris. The absolute devastating, yeah, yeah. soul crushing, the collapse, as it were, left testicle shattering failure of Agile. Right. Of course. I liked this post. It got a lot of votes in the subreddit. Yes. Uh, uh, and it's interesting because it's <clears throat> this gets a little weight because the person writing it. <clears throat> yes. He was yes. one of the original 17 authors of the Agile Manifesto back in 2001. So that yes. gives it a little more credence, don't you think? I do. I mean, I, I... So, again, as with all internet commenting things, if you read the full article, he's not really saying, like, the idea of <laughs> Agile bad. He's saying the implementation <laughs> is bad, and, and perhaps even having a name for it is bad because it created this whole perverse consulting industry of where <laughs> Agile consultants... That doesn't mean you're doing agile development. You're literally consulting with people on how to, yeah. quote, be agile. It's interesting how, um, as people, we'll use language right. in, a, in different ways. Like, uh, uh, we will take terms like terrorism and cloud and yes. agile, and we will, we will all own different meanings for them. And I will represent my meanings for them, and you will represent your meanings for them. And when we talk... Yes. We are talking from our positions, but we're not necessarily talking about the same thing. And that is exactly what happens with Agile. It becomes this nebulous term. Right. Like, you know, the, the, the spirit of the whole Agile thing was like being able to change, right? Being able to kind of yeah. dive into being it. Agile. Right. Because a project is never going to be what you think it's going to be when you write that RFP. But Agile, I mean, be, but sometimes these things themselves almost become a construct that you get stuck yes. up in. Yes, like I once went to a place where they had whiteboards full of <laughs> um, sticky notes, right? And yeah. uh, I'm like, oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Then I went back to my office and opened up my Trello pane. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's just different ways, right? It's just different yeah. approaches to that same thing. I mean, this is, this is an area, it's probably a whole topic in itself for another day, but this is an area where I've struggled. Um, you know, it's super easy to take on the trappings of Agile to do the scrum meetings, to do the burn down chart, to do all of that stuff. And isn't that in some way that common language and common structure, yeah. isn't that useful for a group of people to work together? There's, are there are benefits to it, for, absolutely. I, I think it is, but, you know, Agile... The difficulty I've had with Agile in the past is a lot of people who think they're doing Agile either aren't, Right, you're doing big design up front with scrum meetings and a burn down chart. Or the project like contractually wasn't structured in a way that mm. I feel. Now mm -hmm. I know I've been told that there are ways to do this, but I, I, well, I think have not found it. I think the reason I mean to me it seems like there's such a gap between <laughs> first of all, the contracts have their own legacy, their own you know, they can come from their right. own different area of the business even. So there's such a gap between what the need is there and the business solution to deliver that contract. Uh, it's just it's like that the gap is is I, I maybe some businesses successfully close that gap because they work work really tightly and the people in their legal department are super hip and are totally in with the IT department yeah. and all that. Maybe that happens. I don't know. I've never seen it. I mean, w one challenge that I that I've that I would say in the last in 2014 I definitely struggled with was you know by their nature lawyers are very this for that, right? Very clear, very cut and dry, A for B, right? But Agile, in its truest sense, in my opinion, doesn't really work well with that, right? It's very hard to say we will do this, this, and this for X dollars and then be able to, in what I would consider a good Agile, good change management way, accept change orders 
without grinding to a halt on like formal change orders, contract amendments, things like that. Maybe me, maybe I just need a hip lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I think that's a that's a pipe dream. Maybe uh, the yeah. I mean, I I've my crazy theory is agile and fixed bids. I know. So I've it's interesting. That's where you get hung up on, and uh, right. uh, I I get hung up on. Um, see, that is that is more of a contractor kind of issue. Right. I think where agile probably has had more success is uh, internal team structure. Uh, I think it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Product companies. Yeah. Yeah. Exa- yeah. Um, or even just de- developing an internal product or project. The, just that's just you like an internal thing. But the 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 problem I have. Is I think for and this is a total number I'm pulling out of my butt for about every team I've worked with that really can implement the process. There's another two teams that th- they get too distracted by the process that they become process experts, and only a couple of people are actually doing the work. And so what ended up happening in, in most commonly is, uh, and this is sometimes why I started to resent developers a little bit as a system administrator too, is I would be in a position where I was one of the few people that was. After all the chips would fall, only a couple of people would manage to get the work done at the during the deadline, and I was the guy that was had to be there up there making sure the server could they could push the code to the server and the ser- the service restarted when it needed to, and if the script broke because the guy that wrote the scripts wasn't doing his part, like I would cover the gap. And what happened is I would go into a place, and if their process was busted and they had more people paying attention to the process than the work, uh, I burned out super quick. And I, I yep. don't I, I find that to be really common. And in fact, the people a lot of times that seem to be the biggest advocates that they're not consumed by the process are sometimes the ones that are most consumed by the process. Yeah, I think there's like two problems. One that you're describing is just being a slave to what you feel is agile and kind of the trappings of it, right? I mean, I've seen burn down charts that, you know, are huge and crazy and don't make a lot of sense, right? Um, being a slave to the scrum meeting. By the way, scrum meeting should be no longer than five minutes. Otherwise, you're doing it wrong. Just saying. I mean, what, what would your solution be, Chris? I, I guess that that's kind of <laughs> like small my, my teams. So- my solution yeah. would be small teams that maybe uh, connect back to some sort of central organization. But small, lean teams, people focused on the work. When you have too many people not focused on the actual work, that's where you start to have the problem. So what I've come up with, kind of for the agile project management thing, is both. And this is, again, pure contracting perspective, right? The client and the contractor each need to elect, or however you want to say it, one project manager on each side. Mm. That is the only point of contact. Yeah, that is a really, you know what, having somebody that owns that is actually very useful, especially if you have somebody on both sides. You avoid several issues, right? The From a contracting perspective, I know if this person comes to me and says something, that he or she has not only the authority, but the backing of her whole team, right? This isn't just one person's crazy theory. Um, also, it, do you know how much time is really wasted in meetings, right? <laughs> like every person you add to a meeting adds at least 20 minutes because they have to talk. They have to show that they were... They were there and worth it. Right. My contribution is noticed. That is very common. I'm not, by the way, when I'm in meetings, I'm not that guy. No, I... I I answer uh, direct questions. In fact, I've tried to do something that I don't know if it's gone over super well. Tried to make particularly sales meetings. I've actually avoided, I should, let me rephrase this. I try to avoid having the technical people in the sales meeting now. Yeah, because they'll get hung up on a lot of the semantics, right? right? Yeah. And the sales guys don't care about the semantics or the details. uh, Not only that, but the the potential buyer. I've noticed there's... And this might be a contracting thing again where some um, – now don't send me angry email. <laughs> some developers internal to a client get very defensive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, they're there to catch you. Right. And, and it's kind of like pub trivia and, <laughs> you know, why do we not need this project? And I'm right. kind of thinking, you know, you're wasting my time doing yeah. this. Right? Yeah. You're like, hey, you're the one that asked me to come in. You called me here. You invited me. You know? I know. Oh, my God. I know that feeling. Yeah. So, you're, oh, and, then, and then like – and then every now and then you're like, you think you're going to get me? If you could get me, you'd be sitting on this side of the table, bro. <laughs> right. And, uh, well, the, the problem is too – and it's always like, oh, and, you know, so what do you actually do here? Oh, yeah, I'm like a VB developer. <laughs> yeah. All right. You know so, what? And it's, by the way, I'd full disclaimer, I've also been the guy on the other side of the table. So, well, uh, I, I've, I, 
I try to resist that type of behavior. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But what, what I find happens is, and again, it only nine times out of ten, it's no problem. Everybody cooperates, and you you get to something that makes sense. If you do have that one out of ten kind of you know guy who didn't have his coffee this morning, I'd say it's more than one out of ten. But okay, yeah, I'm trying to be nice. That can derail the whole sale, yeah, right? Yeah, because then the business, the decision maker is like, "Well, this all sounds uh, like some significant internal uh, process changes, and uh, well, uh, we, yeah. we would have to get yeah. some approvals." And uh, oh my god, yeah, I've heard that. I've had that conversation. So, what I've tried to do and seems to be more successful <clears throat> is have the sales meeting, just run it as a sales meeting, and you know, we'll work out the details after before we do an SOW. Yeah. And that's it. And we'll work it out directly with your IT manager. Yeah, and that always works for a while until the IT guy's like, you you got to quit committing me to stuff that I can't do. I got to be right. involved then in these meetings. Like, I, I never agreed to this call, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's that ends up that's en- that ends up being the cycle of it, but that is what you try to do. And, and every client's different, right? Every And if you're getting a job, every company is going to be different. Some of them yeah. are, you know, you know everybody... Yeah. Uh, Zardoz in the chat room, uh, this is what you and I are, are really chewing on here, and he puts it so well. He says, uh, understanding business process and driving that to the technical process, or better put, the solution, is absolutely necessary. Yeah, and I mean, that's the whole point of that the is, show. That is exactly it. That yeah. is nailing it to a T. And, and the thing is, is that sounds almost like, um, well, okay, yeah, sure. The thing is, people really freaking struggle to actually deliver on that. And if you can be one of the few that actually really truly delivers that, that that'll be your big differentiator. That'll get you the, that'll get you better and that'll get you further in the business you work in or the clients that you want to land. It, because the, the people, the managers also need that same thing. They need it translated like that. And the better you are at understanding the need of the business and translating that to an efficient technical solution, the more valuable you are. I, to be fair, like just devil's advocate, I don't actually believe this. You know, one advantage the crazy, fake, agile kind of consulting guys have is that everybody knows they want to be lean, right? Yeah. Everybody knows they want to be agile. Of course. They don't know what that means, but it sure makes them feel good. Yeah, it's like I want yeah. to be. I want to be fit. Well, what does fit right. mean? Does that mean I lose twenty pounds, or does that mean I exercise more? I, I ha- What does fit mean? Like, I want to be fit, and you know, like it's the same right. thing. I want to be agile. I want to be lean. You know, I, I'd like to say that I've never thrown agile terms out there just because I knew the person on the other side of the table would really get get excited about it. But that would be a complete lie. Yeah, well, so, it is a common language. It's a common language, and it's an unfortunate. I wouldn't say it's unfortunate. It's. You know, there is a whole tier of executives, a whole even even of middle managers, actually more middle managers, I'd say, who have been trained on agile, right? Yeah. Like they've they've had the consultants come in. So if you don't speak that language, even if you know half of it's kind of malarkey, you're not gonna get through to them. It's very true. It's very, very true. Very true. You know what you can get through to, Mr. Dominic? Our first sponsor, and that's yes. DigitalOcean. Head over to DigitalOcean.com and use our promo code of absolute power and knowledge. That's Coder Digital, one word, lowercase, Coder Digital. It'll give you a $10 credit over at DigitalOcean, where you can be a boss. Wait, wait, what, what? What do you mean you don't know about DigitalOcean and being a boss? Well, let me tell you. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up your own cloud server. I love this about DigitalOcean. The, the, the startup process is very straightforward, and because of that, We've been able to just sort of implement DigitalOcean as sort of our additional infrastructure. I, I don't even consider it really my offsite infrastructure because I'm not really investing in infrastructure anywhere else anymore. Because DigitalOcean has such great value performance, it's it's an amazing service, and the technology they've based it around Linux and KVM SSDs and the bandwidth connectivity and the data center options make it a slam dunk. And you can get started in less than 55 seconds, so you're not wasting your time. And that's super important to me. And pricing plans start at only $5 a month. All right, well, I can skip a trip to McDonald's this month and pay for my DigitalOcean droplet. I get 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of blazing fast transfer speed. You're going to get a terabyte. That means you're not going to have to worry about watching that bandwidth bill and having surprise changes. It also means it's a fixed cost of $5. You're always going to have a terabyte for $5. So you can go a little, if you want to throw something extra on there, you can. Their data centers are superb. 
They have locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, Germany. They have a great new one in Germany. It's right on a central exchange. So they have fantastic speeds. And then, when, and then it comes to the interface. This makes you fast. Their interface is crazy, crazy intuitive on their control panel. And power users can replicate that interface on a much larger scale with DigitalOcean straightforward API that they just released a brand new version of. It's an awesome package. You can create, set up your droplets, back them up create new ones based on existing droplets. That saves a lot of time. Full DNS management allows you to easily manage your domains. You can take snapshots of your servers right before you make a big change. Do one-click application deployments of things like GitLab to get you up and going even faster. You can say Ubuntu 14.04 with GitLab deploy. It's up to date. It's nice. It's easy. And their tutorials really help you get the best out of it because they've got great tutorials. So go over to DigitalOcean. Go create your own server up in the cloud that you'll have root access to with their HTML5 console and SSH access. You can create anything on this. Install Docker, work on something locally on your machine, and then push it up to your DigitalOcean droplet. That's super powerful. And remember, with that promo code Coder Digital, you get a $10 credit. You can try it out two months for free when you go over to DigitalOcean. And I seriously, if you, if you have an international audience and the value is seriously, it's unbeatable. For $5, you could have a server in Germany and you could have, for another $5, a server, server in New York, right? Each server in Germany has a 40 gigabit Ethernet connection to the hypervisor. They've got their fastest yet SSDs on these suckers in Germany. And due to its placement on the German Commercial Internet Exchange, it's the largest internet exchange point worldwide by peak traffic. It also serves Germany's neighboring countries with unparalleled connectivity and speeds. So you can, not only is DigitalOcean an amazing value and really, really easy to take advantage of, and you support the Coder Radio Show by using the promo code Coder Digital, and they have all the tutorials to really help you take advantage of it, but you look pro. You look like a boss because these rigs are crazy fast, and you can have them throughout the world. So your customers have crazy great speeds. There's so many good options. Go over to DigitalOcean.com, use the promo code CODERDIGITAL and get started. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Coder Radio Program. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. Yes. All right, Mr. Dominic, now would you like to jump into Electron or would you want to spend a little time talking about Disney before we get to Electron? Because I have the hate for Disney today. Yes, so, so this is a little old, and we may have mentioned it on the show before, but, but frankly, you know, great evil requires a repeat. Yes, yes. So, you know, they bought Star Wars, and <laughs> I guess they took the whole Sith thing pretty seriously. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not sure what happened, but Chris, you know, maybe you can explain it better, because I might start yelling. Go ahead. I mean, uh, are you are you referring to which product? Are you referring to the lightsaber well, travesty? Are you referring to the fact that they're making a bunch of spinoff movies? No, are you referring no. to the fact that they gave it to Abrams, who has no none okay. of that? All right. I'm referring to you know, remember a couple of years ago, ideally last year, when a bunch of CEOs from like Disney, Facebook, yeah. Microsoft, sure, all went to Congress and were like home slices. <laughs> They we wanted to sh- never, Yeah, they we want. Well, no, wait, hold on. Are you talking about where they wanted to share like what movie you're watching on Facebook? That thing? Not that thing. Okay. All right. Okay. That's not what I'm talking about. All right, because that was weird. I'll give you that. That was weird. When they, when they went to Congress and said, "Listen, we would never use H-1B visas to replace domestic employees. Uh, there would never be a case where layoffs occurred and then we hired H-1B people. No, that would be awful. We wouldn't do that. Right. Give us more visas. And you know. Yes. Mm. Yes, what yes. So, very recently happened. <laughs> so uh, Disney did exactly what they said they wouldn't do, didn't they? Right. Yeah, and, and their justification is, ah, uh, 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 we laid off some IT workers and replaced, not replaced, and just hired different IT workers. Right. Right. So do you feel like this sort of uh, is a vindication of what you're worried about, or is this a one-off case? I think this, no, I think this is the exact scenario I'm worried about, right? Because... Okay, so you agree not to lay people off and then hire people with H one B. Well, you thing, agree in a non legally binding way, but just saying. Yeah, it was a non legally binding. And the other thing, right. and, and the thing that makes it a bit more of a dick move is they kind of went and made a big stink about saying they wouldn't do this. Now, here's what I right. worry about: how many other companies that are infinitely smaller than Disney that did this on a smaller scale that don't have anybody watching them that never made any promises publicly? Right. Right. We found out about this because it was Disney. Well, the the issue too is. Okay, so let's say you laid off. Let's just be like really, you know, not picking on VB developers, but let's just say you laid off 
100 VB developers. Disney CEO Bob Eager is uh, one eight co-chairs of the Partnership for a New American Economy, by the way, which is a group leading mm -hmm. a leading advocacy group for the increase in the H-1B visa cap. It's, they meet every Thursday on Coravan, and they just... By the way, the, the, the explicit purpose of that organization is to get more H-1B visas. Yes, that That's is. all they want. Yeah. <laughs> like, they have no interest. They're not building factories. They're right. not, you know, you know what would solve a lot of your problems, Disney? I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. It is expensive to hire people on the West Coast. It is expensive to hire people on hey, the Hey, you know who else is on that? Who's that? <laughs> Michael Bloomberg, uh, oh, Rupert Murdoch, and yep. Steve Ballmer. I mean... Come on. It's beautiful. The Boeing CEO is on it as well. All makes sense, right? All businesses that have expensive employees. There's Bob Eager, Disney CEO, right there. And uh, Microsoft also has their chairman of the board, and executive chairman Bill Marriott is also. So Microsoft's got two players on the uh, new American economy. Interesting, I don't see anybody from Facebook on here, because I know they're pretty heavily involved, too. Maybe they yeah, just well, have Rupert Murdoch uh, representing them. It's interesting, right? Because Mark Zuckerberg has been very aggressively publicly stating um, that he can't hire people. Except what he really means to say is, I can't hire people in California that can drive right to my office uh, for a wage I'd like to pay. Hmm. I'm fairly confident, having been on the other side of the table a few times, if you're willing to allow remote working, if you're willing to hire, let's say, people from the Midwest, you know, places that aren't quite as economically built up as the coast. Not saying there's no business in the Midwest. I'm just saying not a lot of tech business, right? There, there's some, but certainly less competition than Silicon Valley. You can, one, pay them less or if you want to, mm -hmm. or you can pay them the same if that's really... Because remember, Facebook, Microsoft, Disney all claimed that their concern was not the wages being too high, right? Of course. They said it wasn't a cost problem. It was an availability problem. So if you're having an availability problem, why can't you allow remote working from the Midwest or other places where you can easily hire people who are out of work? Why not partner with a local technical school to retrain people and hire them out of there? Why not do practicums and, and you know, get the government to kind of ease up on their crazy internship laws and allow people to work as interns and then work their way to a job? Yeah, it is a chicken or the egg thing. I agree with right. Alex Bell. Part of the problem is, is there's not a lot of good devs in that area that are trying. And I mean, it's, yeah. Well, I, what do you mean? There's not any good devs in the Midwest or that mm. Facebook's not interested in hiring them because they'd have to move to California? I think it's a bit of both. I right. think uh, I think if you, <clears throat> it's kind of like back in the, maybe I'm wrong on this. I wish, I, I hope I am wrong, actually. But kind of like back if you want to, well, if you want to be part of Hollywood, you go to California, right? Right, but if you're you're a company and you're saying that you need to get people from half a world away, right, and you have this whole block of states here that have potential employees. I know, I know, I understand that, but right. your argument there is the same argument they are using for the visas. You have this whole block of potential talent out there that we right. can't use. This is the same argument, and I, it's not that I necessarily think it's inherently wrong, it's just... There is a bit of onus if you want to be in a part of a marketplace to go to where that market exists. Now, I say that wishing that because of the Internet, we could all just work from anywhere and just put on our Oculus headsets if you work for Facebook and you're all in a virtual office and you're good to go. I think that'd be amazing. I don't think that's the case. Just ask Marissa Meyer. I think it's less and less the case. Um, and honestly, I tell you, too, I, 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 think, I think the problem is there's enough people motivated to move that they don't need to worry about it. So... I think that's true, and I would also make the counter-argument. I'll just devil's advocate it for you, because this is a surprisingly uh, hot topic for people. Why would you not want to allow work, remote working? Well, there is such a thing as double-dipping, right? A person could theoretically work for you remotely and also do contracting or do whatever else they're doing on the side and kind of skim hours. Not probable, but super possible, especially if it's a younger person. Um, other thing, if you have no business presence in a state and you want to hire an employee in that state, you're now in the jurisdiction of that state. Matters if you're small and if having to deal with the employment laws in each state becomes a problem for you. Right? So that, that's a reason not to hire people in a specific state. Although, if your alternative is getting H-1B visas and hiring people from overseas, well, that's, that's a huge amount of government intervention. Right? It doesn't make sense. 
So, so your argument, Chris, is that because there's not enough people in Silicon Valley. No, do I don't. Think, I think there's enough people. Do you think cost comes into this at all? Mm, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's the that is the, that's right. what's driving the visas thing. Um, I guess what I'm kind of hung up on is I guess this this argument that you're making right now seems like that ship has sailed. Well, I think that's. I mean, this is the argument for. You know, don't build plants in Detroit in the '70s. Build them in Kansas, right? This this argument has failed time and again in every industry because you're never going to get. I mean, with cars it was wages. With this, it's availability, increased competition. By the way, necessarily decreases wages. But just saying. You know, and, and just to going back to the Disney thing really quick because I think I want to refocus on that just right. for a sec because you're talking about wages, talking about saving money. Because this is, I think, your core concern is it's a cost cutting move. And so I want to go back to the Disney thing to give us a little perspective on that. So in the Disney case, they laid off five IT workers, all whom agreed for this interview. So they talked to all five of them for this interview. They were well-paid, longtime staff members who had been previously actually awarded for excellence. So... uh, yeah, and they also laid off a lot more than five people, by the way. Five were interviewed. Yeah, five for this IT. Yeah, I, yeah five in this IT. Right, yes, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry to mean to make it. I think the number might have been 135 people they laid off. It, it, it Actually, they did it in two rounds. It came out to just over 200. Okay, but, yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> so going back to the cost thing. So these people, this five in this interview, longtime employees, awarded for excellence within the company. But the thing that all five of them had is they were well paid because they'd been there for a while. Right, the whole seniority thing. So, and maybe that's a concept that needs to go away, right? Maybe you don't get a raise because a year went by. Like, yeah, no. I'm not, so, I'm what not... makes the difference between replacing them with a visa and replacing them with a guy like you, a contractor? Because you've probably gone in somewhere where you maybe right, are replacing I've somebody. Replaced employees. Yeah. Nothing, right? But the problem is, you know, if you replace them with a guy like me, a contractor, a domestic contractor. Who doesn't do any business overseas? Well, then I, I'm eventually going to hire people domestically again, right? I'm going to have to. If you replace them overseas, all, you're you're adding into the pool talent who wasn't there. Necessarily, if you believe in the basic supply and demand system, will lower wages. Whether you say that's your goal or not, that's what you're doing, right? If if you own a a, a bar, right, and I open a bar next to you you're going to have to be more aggressive about getting customers and potentially giving discounts and lowering wages, uh, not wages, but prices, right? Because I'm right there. To be clear, I am a, this is a total protectionist argument. The reason I'm making it, because I'm, I'm not a, a liberal by any means, I don't necessarily disagree with immigration. My problem with the way they're doing it is they are effectively lying. And not, and also, it's not a good position for the person that's coming into work. They're essentially indentured because their right. citizenship is dependent on that employer. That's a that's right. a, that is an unbelievable amount of leverage. And actually, as a contractor, I'm, I can only speak for New Jersey. You can't tell me to come into your office because if I get upset by that, I'll call the state, and you now have to pay payroll taxes on everything that I did. You have to give me impl- benefits. You can't direct my work. You can't tell me when to come in. You, you can't tell a contractor anything right it's double in california by the way yeah it's true here you can ask you can ask but you can't tell and you cannot terminate the contract because they said no right so good luck with that my, my problem is that this is a lie right because they're not saying we can't get these employees in california right. they're saying we cannot get these employees in the entire united states so regardless of, you know, if you hate South Dakota or whatever state, because the chat rooms. Do you? Does it make you then cringe a little bit when you hear about how we need we we are, we're short on STEM jobs? We need people that we need every. We don't have enough. Like when I hear that, I go really because I know guys that are really talented that have been unemployed for a long time. Well, what we need is something nobody wants. Because, <laughs> no, what we need because it's taking our medicine. We need, and here's my political rant. We need less people going to college. Right? We just do. There are too many college graduates that should not be there. We need more private university partnerships where you go to college, you learn, you learn your trade, and then you, they partner with the business to help you get a job, right? More vocational school, more Votech-like stuff. Because you're never going to say the, the time of, oh, you have a generic degree, you're qualified for all these jobs is gone, yeah, right? Yeah. In five years, iOS development could be like generic Java development. And, well, you know, yeah, you've been developing for 15 years, but um, 
gee, we kind of want this kid who specifically can do this. See, I, do I this. guess uh, I don't mean to be callous, but right. what, what I feel like I'm witnessing is you are processing a, a shift in your industry that I had to process about seven, eight years ago, and that was right. cloud computing is going to come in and totally eat my lunch as a sysadmin. Uh, and the reason why I knew that is because I found myself saying, hey, you know what? Instead of installing Exchange, let's just go with a hosted mail system. Hey, you know what? Instead of going and deploying our own monitoring system, let's just use a hosted monitoring system for like a lot of small businesses. And I realized, yeah, this, it's not the same thing, but it's essentially you're outsourcing my job to a service. And uh, uh, and I, 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 my, my first inclination was uh, fight that, you know, fight the data going off site, uh, advocate for security, advocate for on premises, advocate for control, become become an advocate for self control. And I do feel that way about my own data, but I realize there's no way I'm stopping this trend. There's too much momentum. And so there's a flaw in your argument, though, right? Lay it down for me, brother. The IT admins, a huge offshoring, really hurt you guys. Very true. But you got replaced by technology. You got replaced by automation. The problem is no developer is being replaced by automation for the most part. I mean, I'm sure we could come up with a weird case where someone was. But I follow but what you mean, yeah. This is a one-to-one -one labor replacement. So the difference is, is that, and I'm not saying it's nice to say, oh, let's lay off everybody in California and hire people in Kansas who will work for half the money. Yes, that's a dick move too. But I just don't think you're going to, get these companies not to do something like that. So what I'm saying is take the lesser of two evils, right? Yeah, keep it domestic. Keep it domestic. Keep the tax revenue coming in. Keep it the right way. Keep it safe. Or else we're going to have, I mean, go look at how many laid off GM employees there are. This is not, I'm not talking about things that haven't hmm. happened. Yeah. Go read a book on Ford. Go read a book on GM. You know, everybody says, oh, it's, it's you know, it was okay. Let, let the Japanese auto. You know what we need to prevent all of this? A union. No, we don't need that. <laughs> no, you know what we need? We need tariffs. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, actually. Yeah, tariffs. actually, I am on board with that. Right. A very high tariffs. If you're an H-1B visa person, your tax rate is 70%. Oh, is that unlivable? Sorry. <laughs> because, or maybe you don't put it on the person because that's cruel. I put it on the company. Make them pay a fine of double the salary <laughs> to bring someone over. But, Mr. Dominic, you're a businessman. Maybe you could take advantage of this situation. And, and I'm a Republican, and I want protectionism. Isn't that crazy? Well, maybe you could take advantage of this situation. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? There are, there are things more important than margins, right? At some point, you have to be accountable to your neighbors, your people, not to get sappy, your country, right? If I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. Mark, you're evil, right? What you're doing is wrong. If you say there's not enough talented PHP developers, go to your local college, which is Stanford, by you're the right. way. I know, right? Hire some kids, pay them $8 an hour. I don't care what you pay them, because frankly, college labor, I agree, unpaid internships, it should be. Train them up, and there's your, your workforce. Boom, drop the mic. Boom, that's great. Do it. Mr. Dominic, I'd like to take a moment to emphasize your point and talk about our next sponsor before we get into Electron, and that's Linux Academy. Go over to linuxacademy.com slash coders to get our Coder Radio discount and to support the Coder Radio program. Linux Academy is a great resource to take your skill set to the next level in the industry that you're the most passionate about. And that's why you want to go to Linux Academy, because they're super passionate about this as well. And now, Linux Academy has step-by-step -step video courses, downloadable comprehensive study guides, great, great live stream events that you get to follow along with, labs that spin up the servers for you, seven plus Linux distributions to choose from, all kinds of technology from Linux Basics to the AWS stack. I mean, the full range. A couple of things have just come online recently. Uh, the Red Hat Certified Systems Administrator course, the RHCSA 7 course details are now live. It's a 27-hour course. It's super popular. Lots of hands-on for this one already. It walks you through becoming a Red Hat Certified Systems Administrator. You can go take the, you can go take the test and nail it. This alone, trust me, is worth the price of admission if this is something you need to do. Just this alone. And you, when you become a Linux Academy member, you get access to all of the goodies. And if you have a moment where you can kind of slow down a little bit and you're not in the middle of a course, I recommend you go check out the new Nuggets page. I've talked about these before. They've launched now. Here's an example of a couple of Nuggets. These are self 
self-contained video courses. They don't necessarily fit in part of an overall courseware, but they're, they're, they're tasks and things that you can learn that will make you a more efficient administrator or developer or sysadmin, DevOps, whatever you want to call yourself. Like, for example, uh, creating a Pixie boot server for kickstarted automated installs, setting up uh, Linux SSO single sign-on logins with Linux and Active Directory. I get that question all the time. I, get, I almost get that question probably, I don't know, twice a week. Uh, setting up Linux single sign-ons uh, with Linux and Active Directory. There's a nugget on that. It's just a nugget. What is Active Directory? There's a nugget on that. There's a nugget on uh, uh, LDAP. Ubuntu 15.04. That's a great one. Contig configuring Route 53 DNS. Live show announcements. Quick deploy of Active Directory with AWS. Customizing the appearance and color of prompts. That's a nice thing if you're just curious how to make your Linux prompt look better. Lots of nuggets in here. Look at all of these. Holy crap. Holy crap. That's a lot. Great one-off courses, plus all tons of other, I mean, just so many, so many great courses over at Linux Academy. So get started by going to linuxacademy.com slash coders. Go check them out. They freaking rock. And there's so much good courseware. The self-paced training is excellent. Scenario-based labs give you real experience. The nuggets for when you have a little bit of time. Android development, PHP, Python, Ruby, AWS, Android all kinds of great stuff, and live streams and live Q&As. LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. Go to LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. Take your skill set up to the next level. Get a little bit more out of that review or that next client, or just do it for yourself. LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. <clears throat> Mr. Dominic, let's talk about Electron. And how did Electron let's come into your life? Well, it did. Actually, Chris, I just got a call while you were doing the ad. Uh, yeah. Apparently, I'm running for president as a Democrat oh, now. Oh, good, good. Well, I don't know what happened. Uh, a hill dog could use the competition, so... Yeah, she's like, you can be my crazy uh, yeah. protectionist you, guy. Come you on. And, you and Sanders probably have about the same uh, shots. So. Oh, oh. All right, yeah, so Electron. Let's uh, let, let's love on Electron real quick. Yeah, uh, so uh, this isn't Adam Shell, but it's based on Adam from GitHub, right? Yeah, so but it is... It isn't, Yes, like a fork it is based, or like a. Uh, I would say it's a, 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 a yeah, a maturation of Adam Shell. It's yeah. The history of it is right. Adam Shell was a thing they used yep. for a framework for the Adam uh, editor, yeah. and this is kind of more of a. I don't want to say production ready, but it, it obviously is. Maybe generalized out for for everybody. I think that's fair, right? Okay. It's something for everybody to use for generic needs. And it's open source. Uh, it is open source. Being built by GitHub. Being built by GitHub. There is some talk of a community, but that community seems to be GitHub. Hmm. Like literally people at GitHub. Well, it looks like they say on their page that Facebook, Slack, and Docker and Microsoft are using it too. Yeah, so so Slack, all those, uh, well, I won't say all because I don't know, but certainly the Macintosh Slack app and the uh, Windows one are, and I think, I think the Linux one too, are Adam Shell or, or now Electron apps, You know what? Apps, right? And, and JB Hawker Truth reminds us that the new Visual Studio Code. Yes, that's why. You... That, that's what I was going to get into. Ah. Uh... So let's, let's, let's backpedal, right? Because yep. people might not know what this is. All right. So this is a dev tool for web developers to bring their apps to the desktop. I say that very loosely. Please don't send me an angry email. You can't just, I guess you can, but you shouldn't take your web app and throw it in a wrapper and ship it with Electron. Really, the idea is, you know, let's say you want to focus on Mac, Windows, and Linux for your, well, your team communications application, such as Slack, right? You don't want to write three native apps because that's crazy. <laughs> but you do want some of the nicer, you know, you want to be in the dock, you want notification features, you want to work you want to feel like an app, right? You want to feel yeah. like you're on the system. You're you part want of the some platform. of the things that are niceties right. that you don't necessarily get when you're in a web page. Like, perfect right. example is genuine notification integration, genuine like program icon is running in your dock or tray or whatever it is. It looks right on the Ubuntu pane. It looks yeah. right on the Mac tray. Yeah. I have no idea what Windows <laughs> people do today. Um, I think they just swipe a lot. I'm not sure. I, I actually, I think they roll their face on it. They just kind of, yeah. <laughs> I just tried programming. It, it didn't work. It didn't work? No. Are you on Windows? No, but I was just trying. I do have a touch screen, so I just tried smashing ah. my face against it. It didn't do anything. 
the idea is you're writing HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and if you're crazy, I presume you could write TypeScript or CoffeeScript. I don't know. I've been doing just straight JavaScript and uh, CSS because I'm not a drunken monkey. <laughs> no one's insulted by that, really, chat room? <laughs> Why would you want to do this, right? Well, for I would say more than half of the things you're going to be developing that need to be on a desktop, you probably don't need native performance. And this is a great shortcut, great cross-platform solution. Well, and after our conversation yesterday, the web still seems like a pretty great place, but you want desktop apps, you can make something for the web. You get a good desktop yeah. app out of it. I mean, the visual, I would not be even giving this a lot of consider consideration, but <laughs> Visual Studio Code, I ran that under Linux. It feels legit. I've been running it since I've had it for a little over a week now, and I, I that's kind of the next topic, but it's... Uh, Let's just say I'm still using it, right? I use Slack every damn day. This is kind of the real deal. Yeah. Now, it's, it's not, you know, don't get too excited. It's yeah. very early progress. <laughs> it's, it works, but there's some newness to it. I do feel like we're in danger of perhaps Electron becoming the Flash or Flex. Oh, gosh. Yeah. It does have kind of that feel to it of... Hey, just you know, write your code once, and we'll. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm thinking Adobe Air. Just write it once, and we'll yeah, put it Air. in this container, using the term "container" extremely loosely, and uh, it'll work. Everything I've done on it so far, I've done pretty rudimentary sample applications, do work, okay, and they work nicely. Mm -hmm. And if you, the only big, big giveaway is that the package size on Mac, Windows, and mm -hmm. Ubuntu is extremely high compared to what it would be natively, <laughs> because you have to ship that 50 megabytes or whatever of the whole uh, the whole runtime, or rather, runtime is probably the wrong word, but you know what I mean, the whole package. <clears throat> That so, is a little, a little a little egregious in the day of mobile downloads, but not not insurmountable. Well, I think it's I you know I think we're gonna because there's a lot of competition, right? There's a Node WebKit, there's Tide. In fact, the Tide SDK guys are coming out with something new, but it's kind of invitation only. Hint hint. But there's a whole lot of tools doing this web to desktop thing. Because I think there's a legitimate need, right? We talked about potentially for Xamarin on the mobile side. Yeah. You know, the corporate developer, the customer who needs internal software for their sales team, their HR team, their accounting team, whatever, who doesn't need the crazy whiz-bang, you know, newest native features. This is a way you can go and be, you know, confident that you're shipping something that works. And yeah, maybe it's not the, you know, bleeding edge, right? So, for example, if Apple changes notifications or if Microsoft does, you might be using legacy for a little bit. I don't know. Hmm. Seems seems okay to me. I'm yeah. looking at uh, the Adam.io uh, stats here. Thirteen percent right. of the users are under under Linux. That's more than yes. I thought. Yes. Now Adam is the editor, though, right? Yes. So it's important not to get confused. Adam no. is the, uh, the GitHub uh, Ed. code editor, which is extremely similar to Microsoft because Microsoft was basically like, "Hey guys, that looks good." Right. Uh, <clears throat> the reason why is this is a blog post that they made because the Adam project just hit a year old on May sixth. Yes. That's pretty neat. Yeah, it's funny. I reviewed the Atom editor uh, uh, when it came out last year. I kind of like Visual Studio Code better. Yeah, so should we talk a little about Visual Studio Code? Because I've been playing around with it a little bit. Not a lot, but I've played around like it's Markdown support and, uh, you yeah. know, just just seeing if I can actually believe I'm really using a Microsoft application under Linux so far. So I've been using a hell of a lot of uh, Visual Studio Code this week. One, because I forced myself to, because I want to write a review of it and I want to talk about it today. But I actually don't mind it. Now, there's there's some things. One, performance, you could have lied to me and said it was native. Mm. And, again, other than the package being big, I never would have known. Mm -hmm. I agree, um, yeah. You know, there, there are some <coughs> shortfalls. Well, let's do the positive stuff first. Okay. The IntelliSense works. Ah, yes. And because I can't spell for crap, <laughs> that's a huge feature. You can ask... Really, anyone I've ever worked with, asking the guys in my Slack, it, it, it's unbelievably bad. My spelling, I should be taken out and shot. This works, and it works every time, and it works well, and I'm using it on Mac. I used it on an Ubuntu VM because I haven't gotten my machine yet because I'm still on the fence about which one. Um, works fine on Ubuntu for me. I know there is an extra step to install it, 
depending on what you do and don't have installed on Ubuntu, but mm. there's there's a whole step-by-step thing. It's not hard. Mm-hmm. I haven't tried it on Windows because I don't have a Windows machine, but it's dated. I mean, this is ready. This is probably the best JavaScript ever, editor I've ever used, <laughs> mainly because I can't spell and it's pathetic. Does fall, and again, Node.js is great in it. Um, it PHP is serviceable. Not that I'll admit to doing some PHP. No, not you, no. Python, serviceable. Again, not that I'll admit to doing some Python. It does fall down with Rails. Mm, really? Why they hurt me so much, why they support Node.js and not Rails is unbelievable. Now, Ruby is supported, but I don't get the same goodness on the Rails side that I get on the Node side, and I don't know why. Um, that's a big failing. Another failing is do you like that color scheme, Chris? Mm. It's all right. I don't mind dark. I don't know if I'd want it all the time, though. Uh, well, you're going to have to deal with it. It's either that or an extremely go-blind light one. You cannot add, currently, yeah. Yeah. custom syntax. they got to work on that. That seems ridiculous. Um, not Their default schemes aren't bad, but it's just so jarring because I have a color scheme I use on all my other editors and in Xcode and in IntelliJ. And then I go to this thing, and it's like blue and brown city. Hmm. Um, Look at them making the settings a text file. <laughs> yeah, the settings just a JSON file, yeah, right? Like yeah. The settings are, yep. you just go in there and change things. I wonder how it would hold up against a very large project, but again, I've been doing mostly JavaScripty stuff and, and a bit of Rails in it. So it's not really been pushed. The Git integration is okay. That that's a that's a feature they're pushing pretty hard. Mm-hmm. I I don't love it. You know, it it's your basic commit, push, pull, right? You're not having a lot of advanced features. If you need to do anything of um of any kind of I don't know, like a merge or rebase, anything like that, you're going back to the command line, which is fine. Uh just just to Portugal in the chat. No, not currently. Um they're they're not supporting it yeah they say they will though he's asking if you could change the colors individually in the file no yeah yeah uh so your bottom line is it's pretty good for a 1.0 you think uh or do you think it's not quite 1.0 yet well i i'm still using it i mean i and maybe someone in the community can correct me there may be something i need to do for rail support i would like a vim mode hmm because i'm not a vim guy but even in chocolate which is the editor uh, the native mac editor i've been using and even in Sublime on Ubuntu. I have started enabling Vim mode again because I used to be a Vim user years ago. Cool. That's pretty it, hardcore. I love it's it. It's so well when the file, you know, it's funny because the user, the GUI UI makes a lot of sense, right? The mouse UI, rather, mm-hmm. when the file's not big because it's just so much faster. Yeah. But once yeah. you inherit yeah. something from some psycho PHP developer, and it, I'm sorry, what? Where did I go? Uh, I think you meant um, motivated PHP? Motivated. 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 But rushed. But very rushed. Yeah, he was in a hurry, man. He was in a a real hurry. He could have done better, but, you know. And the file is like 4,000 lines long. Yeah, well. Scrolling doesn't make a whole lot of sense anymore. Just saying. Yeah, Um, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't mind a mini-map. Yeah, it is tempting, as Alex is saying in the chat, just to use Atom, because I did reinstall Atom, and to... Other than the IntelliSense, they're basically the same. I mean, Microsoft did do, in my opinion, a better job. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. They've had that for a long time. But Well, GitHub I, didn't really try. To do you think it. Rails is ever going to be a priority of theirs? I guess it depends on what... I don't know you what know, the state I'm, of Rails is on Azure. If if the state of... Uh, I think Azure is going to be what, what eventually drives the, the, the long-term priorities right. of Visual Studio. And Visual I'm not Code sure that I'm whatever. not wrong. I'm not sure that there's not a setting or something I can change in that JSON file that, you know, will make it yeah. download some Rails plugin or whatever. Maybe. I, maybe. Maybe user error. But I was, you know, PHP works... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I throw up every time I say it. Yeah, it's okay. PHP works really well. And I was a little surprised to see that. You know, I expected Node, because Azure, they're pushing Node like it's, you know, the next Jesus Christ over there. Uh, <laughs> Python? You know why? I mean, why? Because it costs a lot of CPU cycles. <laughs> It's nice and expensive the way we like it. <laughs> exactly. 
Oh, rack of but um, boom. I'm, I'm totally kidding. There. Don't have to send them the hate mail. I'm totally kidding. Actually, we do want your emails, though. Send them to Coda Radio at JupiterBroadcasting.com and go to the contact page and choose Coda Radio from the drop down. We didn't get, we got like a couple of emails, and one of them was like from an episode from like a while ago. So, I'd like some hate mail. It's been a while, yeah. actually. We've I mean, covered a lot of ground today. Plenty, we must have upset somebody. I, I mean, surely if you've applied for an H1B <laughs> visa recently, you're not happy with my comments. There must I, be somebody listening, right? We've I actually, I don't think so. we, have we ever gotten an email saying somebody? That they've yeah. applied? No, we, we've gotten emails from, from folks overseas who said they definitely understand the frustration. Yeah. Which was surprising. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, just back to the, uh, just real quick back yeah. to the Visual Studio Code thing. The nice thing now, in my opinion, is that there are so many good editors out there. Yeah. That if you don't like this, don't worry about it. Get Sublime. Get, yeah. get them. Get Adam. Get Emacs. Get Adam. Right. Yeah, that was actually going to be kind of my point. Is uh, right. Uh, is boy, I love it when I go to the Visual Studio page. The screenshot up there is an Ubuntu machine. I wonder if they must be detecting I'm on Linux and doing that. Do you see a Linux machine when you go to uh, code.visualstudio.com as the screenshot? Do you get an Ubuntu? Uh, I think it shows me a Mac. Wait. Yeah, so they were doing a little OS detection. That's adorable. Uh, I think, you know, I think, for example, if you're going to be doing ASP, you're going to be doing Node, you're going to be doing PHP, this could be a great editor for you, or Markdown even. And if you're going to yeah. be doing Ruby, then maybe look at something like Sublime or Atom. Well, why not? They're all kind of, it's almost kind of like web browsers now. You know, it's like all, everybody's kind of using WebKit or Blink, something kind of like WebKit. And then, you, of course, you've got, you've got uh, Firefox and, and IE, but, like, you've got, like, 10 browsers that are WebKit yep. browsers, right? That are, And they're all kind of get you the same. Safari basically gets you what Chrome does, but with just different dressing and different yeah. features. I mean, really, code, the, the advantage to code is if you are like me and your JavaScript spelling is atrocious and you need yeah. the IntelliSense. Like yeah. that, that's really all they're bringing to the table right now over Atom. Um, and in fact, if your company's on GitHub, I, I'm sorry, Chris, I know you're trying to end the show. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not in a rush. You take as long as you need. Uh, if your company's super tied into GitHub, Adam might actually be better because they have a lot of like direct GitHub support. Like, that was my issue with Adam when I reviewed it was that I was just moving off of GitHub, so I couldn't really take full advantage of a lot of the extra features. But if you're you know, a one-project company or you're just you're using Git, I don't know how presumably GitHub Enterprise would work the same. Hmm. Hmm. That might be worth it to you. Or, hell, just pop open Emacs and be a champion. What do you <laughs> want from me? I just uh, connect to my SSH session that I have running on my droplet all the time. And, open uh, your Chromebook, <laughs> SSH in. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that is what's going on these days. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, I think uh, for me, Markdown right now, I know nobody cares, but Harupad. I'm going to give a shout-out, which is also a Node.js. Uh, this one's no, based on Node.js, but Harupad, if, uh, I know I've mentioned it before on the Coda Radio program, but I'll just give it a quick plug, that is an good. awesome, awesome Markdown editor that uh, one of the things I really, really like about it is if you're just doing Markdown and you're going to publish it, it allows you to take the CSS theme from your website and apply it to the real-time Markdown preview, so it's a, it uses the CSS from the JB website as I'm creating show notes, which is really cool. Another good one is a Chrome app called Stack Edit. That's a Markdown editor. That yes, I've been using for a little while now. Stack Edit is really good. It's browser based and yep. it's it's really good. And it has some collaborative editing capabilities, which I've never gotten to work right. And it'll even sync to Dropbox and Drive, which I've never quite quite gotten the way I want either. Well, they but... just did a big update. If you if you oh, reinstall yeah? it and take the update, it's uh, I can tell you the Dropbox integration works a lot better. And do you end up with like just files on in your dropdown folder that you can just read? Well, they're just not MD, right? They're yeah. just marked out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, so you can cool. just open them and whatever. Yeah. That, I'm gonna, all right, I'm going to give it another go then. Because if yeah. I can get it on a file system somewhere, I'm a happy camper. Because then if my internet's out, worst case scenario, I open up a terminal. Oh, yeah. I vim that, sure. <laughs> that bad boy. that bad boy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I open up Visual Code Studio or Visual Studio Code. I'm going to get it right one of these days. I wish they would have just called it like Visual Code. I wish they just would have called it something one word. They should word. have just called it Code, but I'm sure they can't trademark that. Probably. I'm sure that's exactly uh, why it's called Visual Studio. That's exactly yeah. it. All right, Mr. Dominic, is there anything else we want to cover this week? No, I love Linux and open source. <laughs> uh, maybe you could tell people if they love Linux and open source and things like that, where they could go find someone to do some work around that area for them. They could go to BuccaneerTech.com. I'm sorry, what was that? It. What was that? BuccaneerTech.com. Oh, that was BuccaneerTech.com. Buccaneer. Oh, 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 sorry. I was we're, launching, do... oh. we're relaunching the site to be oh. pretty. What about, okay, how about this? How about, how about this? How about Twitter so they can find out about the relaunch? How about that? How about that? 
Just follow at Doom Manuko. There you go. There you go. And if you'd like to find out when we're live and things like that, follow me. I'm twitter.com slash Chris LES. Jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar also has the secret sauce. We'd love to have you join us live over jblive.tv. We do this show on a Monday, noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of Coda Radio. We'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>